recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectible. This is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's the opening quote of a podcast. I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. And I'm Katie. Welcome to issue number 294 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Every time we record, we talk about comic books. This week's show, we won't have a club discussion, but we will have the weekly reviews. That's where we go back and forth and we talk about the books that we've been reading, whether they're, I was going to say whether they're good, whether they're bad, but my <laughs> My internal script is whether they're old, whether they're new, but hey, they could be good. They could be bad. We'll find out. Um, But we're going to talk about them there in that segment. And uh, no news segment uh, this week, but on our next episode, we do have our uh, March catalogs for the previews. So we'll cover Marvel and DC in our next available episode uh, to see what we're going to be excited for in the future. But in order to get to that future, we got to get through the present and that present comes in many forms of weekly reviews. So let's jump over to that segment now. First up on my list here is something that's been sitting in the stack for quite a while, and I was excited to uh, uh, unearth it from the old pile. It is Space Mocha Origin, Saving Nico Kashi. Wanting to be the first astronaut in space, Mocha finds herself stranded in space after an asteroid accident. She must help various aliens stop the darkness engulfing the galaxy if she wants to return home. Will Mocha be able to return to Earth? Uh, This has story and illustrations by Raya Kamat. This is a book that I remember, if I remember correctly, I got it at uh, Aya Comics in beautiful downtown Skokie. Uh, They have a local creator section. And I, I think this is where I got this. I know I didn't order this from the previews and uh, did a little research. And uh, it seems like that is where I had picked this up. Um, so, yeah, here it is. Uh, I thought it was a, a fun little adorable cover there and Cat in Space. I had read a, a previous um, Cat in Space type of book. I have a copy right here because I'm going to be gifting it to a, a friend soon. And... Uh, Oh, shoot. It's somewhere else. Never mind. Uh, and uh, so I'm like, all right, I, I, I like seeing cats in space. I'm going to go see it. Go ahead and see another one here. And uh, this one lived up to it. This is a fun little adventure. This cute little astronaut cat, astronaut, if you will. Um, we kind of get a little little tease of what's going on in the story where we see a broken shuttle and the cat just kind of floating in space. It's almost just one of those where it's just like, you know, look you know how did we get here let's go take a look and then you see a quick little origin story um on earth you find out that cats are the uh, dominant species you don't see much going on on earth but that is a line they drop on later but um our lead cat here has some cat friends that are kind of waving goodbye to the cat on the opening scene um have a safe trip mocha bring back some aliens and then another little cat pops up a little kitten just goes and some space milk so um, the cats wish uh, the astronaut uh, off into space, but when we run into our uh, problem, there is an asteroid that strikes the shuttle, and very quick into our story, we catch up to that beginning where now uh, our cat is stranded in space. Uh, this is a short story, so I won't go into too many details, but I'll show off some of uh, the art examples. Uh, we do meet a race of aliens, that uh, do find the cat floating out in space, not knowing exactly what a cat is. Um, They have their own missions as they explore uh, the galaxy, but there is an overall threat that is uh, looming. Somebody that is going through and uh, kind of taking over planets and bringing all this dark energy and taking it over and destroying populations, destroying planets. And the aliens uh, realize that uh, with the help of this cat, Um, they can go ahead and try to uh, stop this evil force. Um, The evil force is known as Blood Tholomew, 
And uh, the image that we first see, I'll just use it as a teaser image, so I'm not getting too into the story. But the Blood Tholomew is this uh, vampire bat looking creature here. There's a statue that they're looking at. Um, so yeah, this is our overall threat that we are dealing with here. Uh, Blood Tholomew has placed a monument uh, all across these planets and these sound waves are emitted and they're responsible basically for like mind controlling everybody. So um, yeah, that's what's going on. I'll show just a couple more uh, action pages example. I went to go do some research on uh, <laughs> uh, on Raya, if I'm uh, pronouncing uh, their name right, and uh, found that uh, they had done this in 2022, I believe, and there is hopes to do more. This seems like a very like self-publishing, um, you know, adventure here. So I don't see any other information. There is a barcode on the back. Uh, but as far as anything else, it seems like it's as creator owned as one thing can be. And um, one thing that was cool, too, is uh, locating their online shop. It took a little while because I had to find like an online handle that uh, through Facebook, I was able to get uh, the Raya Kamat. I'll throw the name up there for anyone that's uh, interested. Um that they have this huge like online shop so like they even made plushies of the cash or not they have so many different t-shirts and and like little like little standees that are look like they're little desktop standees there's a lot of merchandise for something that is what i would say is you know a very you know independently grounds root you know create our own thing that's not like in the catalogs or you know on store shelves unless they're going around like oh yeah comics and getting their stuff out there so I kind of applauded them for that, just kind of looking at all of there's so many prints and there's a lot of merchandise for Space Mocha, which I think is awesome because even if you weren't familiar with the story, I think it's a real cute design. And I think anybody would, you know, they see this little cat astronaut, you know, as a sticker or a poster print or something um, plushy. It's I think it sells itself. So, yeah, I was pretty uh, pleasantly surprised. I wish I'd gotten to it sooner, but what's great is that they're still working on a volume two. So while I waited, and uh, that's less wait for me. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely going to pick up more and uh, see what they're doing. But this is Space Mocha. This is the origin story for saving um, Nico Kashi. Check it out. All right. I got Frankenstein Undone from the world of Hellboy and Dark Horse Comics. This is issue one of five. I thought I checked this out in the past, but once I sat down and read it, I obviously haven't. This is done by Mike Magnola, Scott Alley, Ben Steinbeck, and Brennan Wagner. I've been checking out lots of Frankenstein stuff just to see the different varieties of things out there. This was a fun, unique look at it also. It kind of takes place after Frankenstein dies and the monster and Frankenstein are out in the, I'm guessing the Arctic on a ship, they have Frankenstein's body with them. And the monster is just basically depressed going over the feelings he has about all the people that he killed and things that he dealt with in his life after just trying to, understand what life is when he was being born and being created and just out and about enjoying the lakes and the flowers and the atmosphere and everything here's a picture of him just sitting out on a stream trying to enjoy life and of course people attack him and that's what set everything off and started the whole killing spree and so he wants to just like disappear away from people and everything so he's up in the mountains he leaves the ship leaves his father, takes his father's name, and goes on, comes across the polar bear, and kind of like just faces it, and nothing happens with it. The bear doesn't attack him. He sniffs him and stuff, and he's already dead, so he's not like any fresh meat to him or anything like that. But then we get into where he kind of becomes part of the polar bear family and starts hanging out with them. There's two little cubs and stuff. Uh, we come across other polar bears. There's battles with things and trying to find food, fighting over food. <clears throat> and he hangs with the polar bears for a while. We get the whoever the <laughs> I mean say whoever the artist is done by Ben 
Ben Stenbeck. And uh, <laughs> he just makes things. I, he kind of like pulls on the heartstrings of people with the way he lays things out because we see a seal that comes out of water and just oh. has to have this cute little face. Oh, no. And then we get to see what happens to the seal. It's like, really? <laughs> he just couldn't show us the seal being pulled out of water, not showing us a cute face like that. Later on, we have other things because something happens to a cub and all that. And Frankenstein is basically realizes no matter what part of the world you're in whether it's human animal whatever there's just continuous death i mean everything's everybody's just got to kill and destroy and it's just the way the world works but with what happens with our cub and all that it i'm not gonna lay that all out but it ends up being i want a good better picture of the creature if I can find it here. Uh, it ends up being kind of like a Star Wars with Luke and the Snow Beast. We get that in here. What the I heck happened? Why did I? Okay. And these two pages were stuck together. I'm like, I know there's a couple of good pages with him in it. But here's the beast that he oh. Frankenstein comes across and he basically looks like a Yeti style creature mm -hmm. and he's got a medallion on him so it, it's like there's something mystical about it and you find out later on that it's a human being that's a shapeshifter like character and he takes Frankenstein in after he could have killed him but he just basically knocked him out dragged him home and set him up to be <laughs> brought back to health but yet to find out some we do find out stuff about his past and all that there's some very interesting things I don't want to give that all away in here but yeah he heals up Frankenstein and Frankenstein mentions things from his past people he killed all that and this creature man kind of like gives him some stories that also kind of help link them into things and it's very interesting looking to Fr the frankenstein again character well the the monster character but now he's known as frankenstein since he took his father's name and uh there's four more issues so i am gonna have to search them out and find out but yeah that, this first issue is a ton of stuff in here really nice issue great explanation of what's going on and um this is again one of my more enjoyable Mike Magnola pieces. I, I, I really enjoy where the story and the artwork and everything is going. There's nothing that's really throwing me off it yet. So, yeah. Check that out. Dark Horse Comics, Frankenstein Undone. Yeah, I know I was contemplating okay. that. I ultimately didn't get it, but I, I think I will pick it up if I see it out on the rack somewhere. So. Yeah, I think I found this one at like a half price books or something. So. <laughs> All right, let's jump over to Katie. What you got for us? All right, this week we're going back to my favorite place, the galaxy far, far away. I have Star Wars Epic Collection, The Empire, Volume 8. So these stories are, I think all of them were published by Dark Horse at the time, and they're all set right around uh, the original Star Wars movie, uh, Episode 4. And... Yeah, let's jump into it. I really enjoyed this issue, and off the bat, I think if you're a fan of the original trilogy, you'll probably uh, get a lot out of this, because uh, it's so closely tied to the timeline of the movie. Uh, we have stories in here from the Star Wars Tales line, which were um, a, a line of comics that were not canon, and basically the creators could do like what they wanted, so we'd get like alternate endings, different POVs, or humor comics. Um, and then there's a set of stories in here that I was super excited to read. It's uh, The arc is from the Empire magazine, um, and it's referred to as The Other Son of Tatooine, and it's the story of Big Starklighter, who, uh, you know, we get alluded to in the movies and then throughout other media, how he joined the Academy, and then he ended up uh, defecting and joining the Rebellion and then ultimately sacrificing himself so that Luke could blow up the Death Star. So we get to see his story in here and actually get to see 
that, you know, that enrolling in the academy, that learning to be a pilot, and then that uh, defection and then mutiny play out, which I thought was really interesting. I'd wanted to read it for quite a long time, and I was really glad that I got to. It was uh, lovely illustrated. It had just wonderful emotional moments, and even knowing knowing how the character is going to end up, it made me feel like this story added so much more depth and heart and heroism to this character's sacrifice. Uh, I really liked it quite a bit. We have uh, the X-Wing Rogue Squadron uh, 0.5 in here, which um, go back to other issues. I review the X-Wing Rogue Squadron series quite a few times. I love it. And I actually have a physical copy of 0.5, but it was kind of cool to see it in here in continuity. Uh, I really liked that. And then, so... They also did their version of A New Hope, the original Star Wars. And so for 1997, when the special edition was coming out, Dark Horse released their version of that story. Now, previously, uh, Marvel had already done their version, but that was back in the 70s. So it's really cool to see A New Hope, but in the 90s uh, style of artwork and just having a different artist take on it. And it makes me chuckle a little bit because in in uh, documentation and content management, we talk a lot about evergreen content and content reuse. And boy, oh boy, have they really gotten their money's worth with reusing content about A New Hope. Um, so that's pretty funny. But no matter how many times I see that story, I still enjoy it. And it looks great. And Dark Horse Comics did a great job on it. Lovely tribute, as always. Um, and then there were a myriad of stories from the Star Wars Tales line. Uh, the few that I found the most impactful were uh, a what if between Darth Vader and Darth Maul. And then um, we kind of get perspectives from both sides of the war in this book. So we see a stormtrooper who initially joins up and he doesn't really believe in all the propaganda. He's just like, my home planet was crap and I needed a way out and they offered me a job. And then throughout the course of his story, he starts to realize that like he can't just explain away the evil things that he's doing and he more and more starts to feel like his life choices have led him down a bad path and he's like you know what after this next next mission i'm done i'm i'm quitting i'm running away and his luck is with him right up until it runs out and he is the boarding party on um leia's ship the tantive four and he sees, as he describes, the most beautiful lady he's ever seen. And then she shot me in the face. And as we know, the stormtroopers were stuck for stun, but Leia wasn't. So this guy uh, passes away and says, you know, as he is, you know, crossing into the blackness, she'll be all right, but I won't. So uh, an interesting commentary on why people join, uh, how the things that we do affect them, and how that weighs on our soul or not. It, it, in a way, it reminded me a lot of the stories I've read about Vietnam. Uh, it, I don't have anything in particular, but it reminded me a lot of, of that. Has anyone heard of um, Tim O'Brien and the things they carried? It reminded me a lot of those set of stories. Um, they're heartbreaking, but a very moving read. And then there's another one of a uh, stormtrooper who is a clone. He's one of the last remaining clones, at least at this point in canon. And he he does believe in the mission of the Empire. He's like, this is what I was trained for. You know, we are bringing, bringing peace and, and justice and security to the galaxy. And, you know, when we do bad things, there's a reason for it. And in this story, they go on a mission to attack a place where there's supposedly some rebel activity. It's they're, they're told it's a weapons depot. So they go in, they blow the place up. And they get back on the ship. The guys are all roughhousing and celebrating with each other. And his captain, his leader, admits to him that, no, it wasn't a weapons depot. That was a hospital. That was a med center. And the clone says, well, you know, it's not your fault. You didn't know that. You know, the rebels led you there. They totally led you on. And he's like, no, I knew what it was. I knew what I was doing was wrong. And I did it anyway. And that sort of sets off it asks the reader to question their conscience and what is right and wrong and and how does that play out. Now, a subplot in that story is there's a rebel cell on um, this base, but that's, to me, not as important part of the story. And in the end, 
um, we find out the base they are on is the Death Star, and so this clone goes down with the ship, and he feels at peace with his life of service to the Empire, and um, we get to see, again, the weight of war on an individual's shoulders, and so much we we hear about the idea of the spirit of rebellion or the spirit of the dark side and the empire he's like listen you might kill me today but you you can't take down the whole empire and what it stands for i'm just one man and today is only going to show you know how how evil and how terroristic and how war hungry those rebels are um and he says you know our sacrifice will not be in vain they can't silence a million voices and that's how it ends it fades to black um beautifully illustrated and again really diving into what does it mean to serve and where and how are those lines that we draw for ourselves and i always appreciate seeing multiple approaches to that because it's it's just a very human story and then we end on a lighter note with tag and bank who are kind of recurring characters in uh the star wars dark horse canon that are sort of like NPCs, background characters in the story, and goofy things always happen to them. They always end up in trouble in the heat of the action, and they always survive. So um, that kind of closed out the book, and we get to see them um, accidentally becoming stormtroopers on the Death Star and how they survive and escape that. And we got a couple other humor comics in here from the Star Wars Tales line, um, but all in all, I really liked this. I quite enjoyed uh, particularly the other sons of Tatooine. And even though I've read these stories from the Star Wars Tales line, it's, it's been like five or years more. So great to read them again. And it hit so many, I think, important notes that, that expand the Star Wars canon and keep you interested. And it looks great doing it too. I love that. Anyway, I really enjoyed this. That's my review of Star Wars Epic Collection, The Empire, Volume 8. Check it out. Uh, I had a question for you, especially since yeah. you mentioned them both in the same comment. Mm-hmm. I got like almost all the Star Wars stuff from the 90s, but I have yet to yeah. dive into it. And I was thinking Star Wars Tales always looked the most interesting to me. Star Wars mm-hmm. Tales, are they actual Star Wars Tales or are they more like what if? Because you They're mentioned... more like a what if. Okay. So I but should stick are... with the yes, stuff they... first. And... They're fun. Yeah, they're more of a what if, but I do find them interesting and and fun, and um, I still think they're worth their time. But if you're like, hey, I want to follow the main story, no, they just kind of do their own thing. Because yeah. I want to jump into some of that Star Wars stuff this year. I just got to decide where I'm going to start. <laughs> yeah. Good. good. All right. Uh, next on my list here, another one that's been sitting on the stack for a while. I am talking about Peach and the Isle of Monsters. Meet Peach. How did she get her name? What's her secret? What have the monsters taken from her village? Seeking independence and prove she's a warrior, Peach begins her quest to save her village from the monsters from Monster Isle and meet some interesting people along the way. Action adventure, it's all here. This is done by Franco, Agnes Garboska, Marshall Dillon, and Zach Atkinson. All right, this is something that I... uh, most likely picked up from Franco's table at the C2E2 or pop, possibly his website because it is uh, autographed on the inside here. But uh, I unearthed it from my stack once again. I've been really in the mood of uh, tackling the graphic novel stacks, the trade paperbacks and such. I have so many single issue stuff from last year that I'm just so behind on. Uh, but these are the things I've been in the mood for and just kind of the, the less, you know, grander superhero stories where it's chapter 957 of something so I, i've really been excited to uh tackle some of these other to read pile graphic novels uh this is a fun story especially when uh since i had purchased this i'd become a bigger fan of uh agnes garboska i've talked about her a couple times in the show as well as franco and yeah this is a story about peach uh peach is a young girl who is uh uh, mostly getting made fun of on the island that they live on. There's a group of kids that are kind of laughing at her name, and and she's talking about how she's named after where she came from, and she has this story that she came from a peach. And, of course, the kids all just find laughter in that. Nobody's taking her serious. That just makes her furious that she's not being treated uh, 
you know, that she's not being believed in the stories that she's telling. Um, her father comes in to kind of hold her back from, uh, you know, going wild on these guys and beating them up and stuff. She's ready. She's ready to strike. And uh, he kind of gives her a lesson about, you know, just kind of controlling the anger and it doesn't matter what they think, you know, it's, and just kind of really talking about just ignoring them. Um, but he, he goes a little more in depth with the story about uh, where, where she came about in this whole peach thing. And, and it involves a sword that he had used to, uh, to eventually find her, rescue her. Um, and she is given the sword. This is all just within the opening pages. Uh, she is given the sword and basically kind of told to go off on her own journey. And he thinks that keeping her there, I, I can't really gauge what kind of age we're talking about for these characters here. They're all drawn in, you know, I guess what a, would be like a kitty type of style. Uh, so it's hard to tell just kind of the actual age, age range. But uh, her father, um, this, you know, sensei looking guy here, basically is just like, nope. He's like, I'm holding you back. You got to go out there and, uh, you know, fend for yourself and, you know, basically just kind of shoving her out the door in a loving way. Um, and that sets her off on this adventure. Uh, basically this whole, uh, there's two stories in this book. The first story is dealing with the fact what the uh, synopsis was talking about, that there's a lot of uh, thievery going on in this island and these monsters are to blame. We jump into some action. We see some animals on the island that she comes in contact with. She just goes right into uh, the fray right away and is, and is trying to protect. And and she meets up with other people who are basically assembling as part of like a, I think like a mission or like a birthright of uh, where they're like, oh, we're all kind of called together to to protect the island and fight these monsters. And uh, the cover that I showed uh, shows some of the monsters, but I'm going to flip ahead so we can see some examples of what we're looking for. But um we see the how the the interaction with those uh, kids that were making fun of her, how they play into the uh, grander story. Uh, she meets new people. She runs into monsters. She's uh, helping animals and she's running from animals. Here's a quick little shot of uh, a monster uh, fight that she finds herself in as she's being chased on this island. Um, that's all I'm going to talk about that one there to let the reader uh, find out what happens next. Uh, but it's a lot of adventure. Uh, it's, it's a lot of her standing up for herself and talking about that even though people tr treat her less than, she knows her worth and she's more than that. And she's ready to just you know start swinging that sword that she was just gifted and uh, ready to go into action. I'll do a quick little tease for, well, we do meet a cute little monkey that she... Uh, she saves some animals uh, later on in the story, and this monkey basically becomes a, a companion to her, and they kind of go off on their own little adventure uh, with a little adorable monkey there. And the backup story in this here is a pirate story, Katie. Um, it's a fun little pirate Yay. story. Yay! It, it kind of ties in with the whole monkey thing, so they even though it's a separate story, it still kind of picks up with what we learned in that first one. It's just yet another adventure. Um, and I, I assume this all exists as just this graphic novel. Um, it's very possible that maybe this was like one of Franco's Patreon comics that eventually got published as a paperback or something, or it was strictly just a paperback release. Um, Cause I'm not, I'm not gaining a sense that there's a, collected issue format to this rather than here's a book it's got two or three stories in there have fun but yeah this pirate story basically has uh peach and uh the monkey uh boarding this ship as they're sort of sort of held held captive and everybody's kind of after uh, not only this monkey but other things that are going on around the islands and all these other legends and there's just a lot of a lot of crazy lore happening, and uh, I'll show this one too, just because we do see a uh, a sea creature um, uh, attack the uh, the pirate ship in here. So there's just a lot of cool adventure, fantasy, fun items here. Uh, looking at the back cover, it's definitely uh, Franco uh, did a, like a pinup for the back cover, which is pretty sweet there. 
yeah, this was a lot of fun. Another thing that's been sitting on the stack probably for over a year and finally just uh, been like, you know what, I'm going to read this now and extremely enjoyed it. I'm going to talk to Franco again in the, at C2E2 and then I can uh, see if I can get a little more backstory on uh, if this if this is everything and if there's any intention for more. I think this was published in 2022. Um, so yeah, it's still uh, 2021, 2022. Um, so yeah, it, uh, I would say it's still pretty fresh there, but uh, I would like to see more adventures of uh, Peach and the Isle of Monsters. And that is from uh, uh, Action Lab, which I know they've worked with in the past. So there we go. Derby. All right, we got Rogue Sun, number one. This is by Image Comics. That's Ryan cool. Ryan Perot or Parrot wrote it. We got Abel is the artist, Chris O'Hallerhan, which I know that name for colorist, and Becca Carey in this. This is very interesting. I don't know where I is probably another half price book pickup. But uh this character is really cool. Like Katie said, <laughs> that image is awesome. He's uh basically has a, a like a sunstone that powers him and he's we get introduced to him he's dealing with an entity that he's having problems with and uh eventually something happens or he gets killed off so we uh jump from that and you got basically there's him at the end of a battle and it says the night falls and he does have that knight style armor character to feel to him and we jump from his death to, to a school scene where we get to meet his son which is this character right here and he's just depressed troublesome causing problems always having issues just living the teenage troubled life <laughs> the normal thing you have and uh all of a sudden he comes home and there's this guy sitting with his mom in the living room and he's like we got to go over some things and the kid's like oh what did i do now because he's been in and out of trouble with schools they've had a bounce in and out of schools apparently because of his problems and all that stuff but here it's a person that's a lawyer or whatever coming to explain that we're going to be reading a will for your father and we want you to be there. So he has to go to the reading of the will. Well, his father left him a long time ago, got a new family. <laughs> so him and his mother are left in kind of like a crappy situation, not very well off. All his father and his new family just happen to live in this giant mansion that they're going to see him read the will at. Uh, basically, the will hands everything down to the second wife and her family. She gets everything of his except for a little box that gets given to his other son. It's a little golden box. It just so happens to be the sunstone. And the guy explains to his son, nothing's being hit in this superhero style thing. It's like, he's like, you know, your dad was rogue son and this is how he was powered and he wanted you to have it. So you could take over his ability and become the second rogue, the next rogue son. And so that's his inheritance. He goes home, plays around with things. Doesn't again, another character that gets a power <laughs> instead of being smart maybe getting a friend testing some things out seeing what your power does learn about your power and all that it's like no i'm just gonna take the power throw the suit on someone's in i the stone has an ability whenever there's something wrong it'll like start to glow and light up and let you know that you got to go somewhere kind of directs you to where the problem is so it started to glow and stuff and he just what the heck first time let's suit up and let's go solve or take care of a crime or whatever and it's like well you don't know what how to use your powers but you're gonna take that ability and here's him morphing in for the first time into his outfit which is pretty awesome two-page pullout i like how they did that and uh 
he goes comes across this guy with silver head helmet type thing it's kind of like a swordsman he's got like a oh what you call a fencing style sword that he's walking around with but he thinks that it's the rogue son he's like i thought i heard heard you were dead and then he finds out when the kid tries to punch him and stuff well you're not the rogue son <laughs> that's not what he'd do he'd actually use his powers or something to take me down so he he's nice enough not to kill the kid off right then and there but he lets the kid know that well when my boss finds out about you you're you're probably not going to last long. He's going to hunt you down and take you out. So that's where it's going to lead us into with the rest of the story. But I really like the concept of this character. It's, I kind of enjoyed the father more than the kid. Hopefully the kid will grow into it and be more enjoyable to work with, to see how he works out with the suit and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm definitely going to check more into this run. Also see how far it went. I haven't heard much about it so i'm guessing it was a shorter run but yeah it's image comics they always put out some fun and interesting stuff so check out rogue sun cool 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 <clears throat> yeah looking at the clz app it looks like rogue sun the 19 issues oh, wow way more than i thought i figured maybe 12 tops yeah it looks like december 2023 is the 17th so, yeah, this one was in 2022. I was surprised it was that new. So yeah, it looks like the uh, the 19th is scheduled for May of this year. So, oh, it's still running. Okay, yeah, so yeah. that might go might go beyond that then. <laughs> Okie doke. Maybe I'll have to see about trades. <laughs> okay, let's jump over to Katie. Uh, we know what you have. Let's hear about it. All right, this week I have The Mangalorian, an obvious parody from Keen Spot Entertainment. Uh, it is written, created, and edited by Rob Potsy Pacek and by artist Troy Dungara, friend of the show, and colorist Frederico Siak. And the character designs are by Rob Troy and Nick Lowry. All right, this is a parody of The Mandalorian. Uh, where do we start with this? All right, Mango is a delivery driver. He works for a company that has brown uniforms and brown trucks with a gold shield that is definitely not UPS. Uh, so anyway, he comes into the hub and his uh, boss is like, hey, I got some work for you to do. And so he's got a package. He takes it over to the space Walmart, gets in some trouble with the employees because uh, he was interrupting their break and they did not appreciate that. Um, gets in a tussle with them and he all of a sudden the package he's holding to deliver pops open and uh this little green baby looking dude with glasses and a beard and a bouffant of black hair pops out um and mando mango <laughs> immediately bonds uh with this very furry baby and he escapes the space walmart but he gets out to his beat up old delivery van and sees that somebody has taken the wheels off and it's on cinder blocks uh, but then a character named Nick Nolte uh, shows up to help him get his um, wheels back. And so they go out and uh, try and get them back from these ne'er-do-wells called the Wonka Wuckas that <laughs> stole his wheels. Uh, and then he's got to go, you know, he realizes this is a special package. So he has to go to the next place to drop off a delivery where he meets up with Cartoon C-A-R-T-U-N-E. Um, and now they're going to form a team and a posse. And then finally, they go to the mother of all package distribution centers at Amazon to drop off this magic package, where we find out that um, Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, uh, wants this package so that uh, he can own not just the retail market, the digital market, and the streaming market, and all the little merch that this little cute guy can deliver. Um, so Mango faces out with Jeff Bezos and he wins and Bezos ends up looking like a dork and it seems like everything is going to be going well, but then out of nowhere comes Moth Mickey and Moth Mickey and Mango have a shootout in their spaceships and we get a, um, uh, very disturbing looking Michael A. Mouse at the end of the book. Uh, with the dark saber cutting out of uh, the 
um, not TIE fighter. And uh, yeah, anyway, the kid is safe until next time. And this is the way. Uh, this is a goofy issue. Or it does remind me a lot of the Star Wars tales. Uh, every panel has something funny about it. Like, for instance, Mango's boss is a Paul O'Creed. His last name is O'Creed. And I'm like, there's there's Irish people in, in space? Okay. Uh, all right, cool. Um, you know, we got all kinds of goofy stuff. It's funny. It's colorful. Under no circumstances should it be taken seriously. Um, if, if you treat Star Wars like religious dogma, you might want to tap into your inner child before reading this, because otherwise you probably will either not get it or be offended. But I think it's hilarious. Uh, great use of incorporating and parodying public figures. And I think the people who wrote this genuinely do enjoy The Mandalorian and are trying to make something that's funny. Um, it's a humor comic. It's not that deep, but I really enjoyed it. This cover is by... Oh, come on. It always does this. Cover is by Troy Dungara. It has Mango uh, holding his box and Carrie in his checklist. And then I have an alternate cover with a Baby Yoda George Lucas hybrid uh, and Mango, um, which is awesome. I'll have to bring that out sometime. I really liked this. Uh, it was very funny. It reminded me of the Star Wars tales. I felt like it would go right in home there with all the color and the humor and the winks and nods and nudges to all these different references. And I was super happy to support our sister podcast and the team over at Cartoonist by Night. Um, anyway, this is the way, and this is the obvious parody, The Mangalorian. Check it out. Excellent stuff. All right. Uh, jumping over to the last one for the weekly reviews. Not a New York love story. Not as kind of crossed out when you look at it close, but not a New York love story. Is this a dream or reality? He can feel her presence. He knows she's there, but she isn't. She takes him on a trip around New York and all the places he wouldn't go before, before the accident. From Coney Island to the Lower East Side, he's turning the pages of his life with the one he loved, the one he lost. Not a New York love story is a tale of emotions, grief, and a love letter to a city like no other in the world. Not a New York love story is not a romantic comedy. It's a drama, a tale of two lost souls with the Big Apple as its witness. This is done by Julian Village and Andreas Giffey. Apologize if those aren't the pronunciations. This uh, was something I remember seeing in the catalog. Um, I liked the title of it, and then I liked it extra when I just saw that they were specifically crossing out not. So I'm like, all right, this is an interesting uh, take on this. Uh, beautiful uh, cover there. A lot of pinks is for the sky and the water and just really love the design there. And uh, this was this was a pretty powerful story. Uh, I think a lot of this is done in the illustrations. Um, you have a lot of panels uh, without words. So you really do see the uh, the emotions and the vibe and everything that's going on in the story with the characters that are right there on the page. Uh, beautifully guided by the script uh, and then beautifully drawn and to uh, bring these characters into uh, this world. We don't, I don't think we're given any names for these people. Um, the story is mostly following uh, the lead guy here who is just kind of going through his everyday life in New York. Uh, throughout the story, we see some conversation uh, with a therapist talking about dreams that he's been having. And these dreams throughout the story is basically coming back to his home um, after this accident that we just later, you know, just get more information about that the love of his life had uh, died tragically. And, and she just happens to be here in the kitchen, just kind of wondering where he's been, what he's doing. And he's starting to trip out. This is happening several times throughout the story. You see him kind of go about his life. He's, you know, taking the, the subway and just you know, trying to talk to friends. Here's a great example of uh, there's a lot of panels across two pages, very little dialogue, just a lot of a lot of great scene work here. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there is some uh, some information about how, you know, how deep they went into studying New York and trying to really get this, you know, not creating a, a fake New York for the story and just really catching that. So 
I'm sure that there's a lot of people if they're from the city that uh, you know it's it's gonna you know organically feel feel like it's New York City. Uh, the therapist is trying uh, trying to kind of dissect these dreams and kind of wondering you know what's going on with him, you know uh, seeing his girlfriend yet again. You know, they, they he goes out in public. They have like picnic dates, and they go to Coney Island. They do all these all these adventures, these day trips, these dates, uh, all these things that you would you know get an idea that they have done or had always wanted to do, but never got around the time to do it. And he's just existing with the public. You don't see any interaction with anybody. Uh, you know, you see people walking around and everything like that, but he really has no kind of outburst in the in in public where people are kind of looking at him weird and if he's talking to himself and things like that but yeah he's literally just uh going along with this but then we kind of repeatedly get to these moments where um you know he wakes up and realizes that it was all a dream and what does this mean and and he's he's kind of recommended to you know get in touch with some friends because he hasn't been you know after this accident he's definitely been pretty sheltered and kind of closed himself off from everybody else. And you just kind of see how he's out of it when he's talking with a friend too. And we see the friend thing come up a couple times in here, but yeah, uh, nothing I'm going to go into too more detail with. Um, I don't know how to explain it. Like the color wise, like it's a real, like, well, if like a soft tone, like it's not like real bright and doesn't like sit there and hit you. Like it's very, I, I'm sure there's a more educational term on that, but that is the style throughout this entire story where you just kind of um, felt very calm and quiet, I think, is kind of what I'm looking for. Um, and I think the last thing I kind of want to promote about this is that after reading it, you know, there was no comedy moments in here. It was, you know, tragic throughout, it, you know, beautiful to look at the art. And then by the end of the story, without saying anything, I, I finished it. I looked, I'm like, okay, that was the end. And then I'm sitting there just, it's one of those that just really makes you think about what the heck did I just read? Not in a sense of like, none of that made sense, but I think it's one of those kind of stories that if you revisit this again, you're going to see it through a whole different light. I think that's kind of what I want to promote there for that book. So yeah, it uh, here here's a good example of uh, some someone that doesn't say who the quote is from so maybe it's from the creators or the publisher but eternal sunshine of the spotless mind meets the sixth sense is how they're kind of talking about it so yeah it's 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 a really great piece of work and really great illustrations and beautiful work but it is very dark and depressing and grim and just there, there's no real joy in here except for the moments when he does get to see the love of his life again but also knowing that she's not real because there was an accident. So yeah, that was an interesting one. I decided to put it at the bottom of the list because, you know, starting with all the fun, you know, stories we talked about, um, there's a purposeful reason to just be like, yeah, I'm going to leave this one towards the end there to kind of bring the mood down a little bit. <laughs> only, only thing I could think color-wise is like pastels, like they use lighter shades of all colors. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, yeah, it definitely has a lot of uh, Easter, spring type colors like that. Yeah, but yep. it's it's one of those that like the, I guess like the inking is very fine. Like there's not a real boldness. Of, there's no thing that kind of stands out in any of these pages. Like everything kind of exists at the same level of importance, whether it's the background or the foreground. And it's just real, real fine work. So. But yeah, all right. So yeah, that is not a New York love story. And uh, yeah, and it seems like this too was uh, something that was possibly adapted from like France or Germany. Um, I was getting that vibe okay. I was doing some research because I was trying to get the pronunciations on some of these names here. And mm -hmm. any kind of review I would find like on YouTube was all in like, different languages and oh. so I, i've read a couple things like that before where i've had like the you know the english adaptation and stuff so i got a feeling that there's you know these creators are you know bigger in their native 
native uh, cultures and everything. And I will mention that in the back here, you see, and not for maybe every page, but a lot of pages, but you see a lot of the layout work from the uh, illustrations and the, the pencil stages. You see examples of uh, from pencils, you know, rough pencils to final pencils. And so I complimented the artwork a lot in here and it was great to see that there's a lot of, a lot of that stuff that they, you know, highlight at the end of the book to show you how it was made. All right. So now that everybody is bummed out, we're going to end the show on a, <laughs> no, we're going to end the show on a high note um, with some plugs. Um, at the time of this episode releases, it depending on when I get it out, it's been uh, it's been a busy week ahead. But there's a Sunday, March 10th, Comic Verse, Lucky Dogs in Nina, Wisconsin. I'm going to be there, uh, just myself there for uh, with my art and representing Cartoonist by Night, representing the Crimson Cowl Comic Club, and representing Crimson Cowl Media because I will have uh, some copies of the uh, the comic book that the Davids from our group have uh, made tales from the north uh the dungeon so i am in possession of some of these to uh to try to you know advertise and uh, sling some books for them uh in addition to original art i got small little sketch cards i got slightly bigger sketch uh, drawings i've got bigger poster prints i've got bookmarks and yeah so i keep adding new stuff every time i'm at a table if you see some old stuff there that you saw at the last table, you can just go ahead and buy it. Then it won't be there the next time. It's a real easy, you know, I'll be fine with that. But no, you'll always see new stuff because I'm just constantly drawing stuff. So that is going to be Sunday, March 10th, Comic Verse, Lucky Dogs in Nina. If this ad is just a day or two late, it was on all the other promotion of the episode. So we should all know that by now. Sunday, May 5th, Madison Mighty Con. That's a little bit away uh, away. But the uh, myself and I know at least one of the Davids will be there. I never know uh, the full confirmation yet. But Sunday, May 5th, Madison Mighty Con. That'll be our second time at that location. So we're excited to revisit that one. And that will uh, have all of us there. So Crimson Call Media, David and David and myself. Most likely. Subject to change. All right. Um, CrimsonCowl.com for info and original web comics. Uh, Crimson Cowl Comic Club on iTunes. Listening to the audio version. Then you can hit subscribe. You can rate and review. That's definitely going to help with the uh, future of the podcast. If you are listening to this and you're like, eh, they were describing all this stuff with, you know, the with the, the not a new york love story with the with the illustrations and the pastels and and frankenstein this and, and star wars that and you just be like i need some more visuals to this well you can go over to youtube and you can search crimson cowl comic club on youtube and you can watch the full video version yes every audio version that you're listening to has the video version companion piece so check that out you can subscribe like and comment on that that would be much appreciated. Uh, Kirby has a spinoff podcast called Under the Cowl of MS. You want to let the people know what's been going on over there or what's to come in the future? Oh, when you're seeing this, I probably will have the last of my Mighty Con individual creator reviews out that I've been doing that I started this last week. Also got some fun unpackings, including an original artwork of me as a zombie and my wife as a vampire. That was awesome. Uh, yeah, we also got lots of fun ones coming, artbaltazar.com. Finally got his website fixed up and working right now. So I went in and I bought a bunch of stuff I've been waiting to pick up. So we're going to have a nice package from him coming to unpack and a couple other things that I ordered that will probably be out by the time this episode comes out. So check those out. Lots of fun reviews and unpackings. And then you also did some stuff for uh, Happy Wolf Art. So Kevin Wolf, you have got some videos out there for this as well. Yep, to fight a Hessian. It's a very interesting and fun book that he just put out himself. So check it out. Cool, cool, cool. And uh, I'll be curious to watch your upcoming Art Balthazar unboxing to see if you're going to get a sketch card. Did you see, hear his comment at all? No, I didn't. So I, I of, missed that he did a podcast twice now. And <laughs> so in one of those, which uh, I forget which one, but uh, he did make a mention about, you know, 
So you 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 na- you were name dropped, so maybe you'll get something. So <laughs> I know I gave him a hard time the last two unpackings. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, check out Under the Call of MS wherever you get your podcasts, as well as YouTube and Instagram. A lot of content coming from over there. I have some art accounts on Instagram and Facebook at Anthony Latch L A A T S C H, and uh, yeah, so I I post almost daily. Uh, art just a lot of different series i wrapped up finally my um my selena plus chef series i may have shown some of that on the podcast and cartoonist by night as a sneak peek but i held on to those for a while because i was waiting for a stretch of seven days where i didn't have to plug like the next show i was doing because i had a couple of shows pretty close to each other so i was like waiting for a perfect seven days where i didn't have to interrupt the feed with a random image in the middle of the selena plus chef so it's selena gomez plus a bunch of cartoon fictional chefs uh based off of the hbo max or max show um so i have that stuff going on and i just have a pile of art just waiting to be posted so just check out anthony latch over on facebook and instagram also, I host Cartoonist by Night, and I draw alongside my friends as we hang out, talk, draw, and uh, recently all our episodes are bringing on some cartoonist friends. Uh, the episode with Eric Wolfgang is out there, um, so check that out. That is a lot of fun, and we have one in the bank that I have to edit yet, so it might be out by the time you hear this, but we had uh, Alejandro Rosado on, who is a known uh, Chicago creator and known for creating Alley Cat, his mascot character, as well as working with All Yeah Comics and a bunch of other stuff. And uh, yeah, so that was an awesome hang. Um, I had only interacted him with him once at a C2E2 a while back, so I didn't have that much you know, connection with him. Normally, a lot of the guests come on, and you know, I, I know everything they've done and everything. So this was fun. He's got a lot of great stories. He's very inspirational when it comes to creating and uh yeah that is an awesome awesome hang so look forward to that by subscribing to cartoonist by night over on youtube all right uh oh yeah i was holding this the whole time he did the uh, variant cover for happy astronaut issue two which is the one where my pinup was printed in my first ever art pinup so i was you know i extended my um the honor that it felt that uh, my art was uh, printed with his artwork that was on the cover. So I uh, told him that when I'm see him at C2E2 this year, this is coming along so he can sign it. And I pre-purchased an awesome uh, original art Ms. Marvel cover that he did a while back. I saw that on his website and then, uh, yeah, so I'm excited to uh, check out his table and re-meet him now that we're friends. So. All right, um, that is going to do it then for this episode. Thank you for checking it out. If you like what we do here on the show, go ahead, tell a friend, share it, like like it, and whatever, all that fun stuff that is definitely going to help motivate us as we go on because we are getting closer to issue number 300 mm. of this very podcast. So we're getting to that you know month away type of thing where I'm going to have to look mm. up. And I know I have a couple of weeks where I won't be here. So I got to look at the calendar and see where that's going to fall to see if we can kind of throw it out to David and the other guys and make sure we see, you know, if there's any kind of uh, planning we can do to give them a heads up that we can see Eric and Damon and everybody again. Mm -hmm. um, I have to make myself a note right here as I type. So I don't forget. And there we go. I didn't really type anything, but me seeing a bunch of SJD, GLA, JSD, GLA, that reminds me I have to go do something. Okay, that is going to do it. You know, I'm just buying time on a short episode. This is how it happens. (laughs) But you know what? That's going to do it for this episode because this whole time I've been hoping. Nope, that was a typo. Uh, Actually, no, it wasn't. I just read it wrong. This whole time. I've been hoping the first Castronaut brings back space milk. I've been creating Frankenstein's monster powered by the sun. Copyrighted. And I've been Wisconsin's favorite Jedi ambassador. To be continued.
Slimer.